if we want to be part of the enforcement process and call out bad actors who are either overfishing, polluting, attacking free flow of trade and so forth, you really can't do this very effectively uh, when you're not a member of the wider UN process. This past September, after decades of negotiation, the High Seas Treaty was signed at the UN and happy delegates hailed a win for the ocean. At last, the ocean beyond our 200 mile national jurisdictions, the ocean accounting for two thirds of the earth's total ocean will be protected. Finally, there will be jurisdiction for protection of marine life against pollution, against overfishing, and to manage the quickly emerging industrial revolution of blue technology. Hooray, right? Well, not so fast. How will this treaty get ratified by the required 60 nations, including the United States? After all, the High Seas Treaty is legally binding because of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982, or UNCLOS, which the US has still not ratified despite endorsement from every US president, the Navy, and seemingly all the relevant commercial and non-governmental organizations. What is at stake here? And can the new High Seas Treaty, sorry, turn this tide of opposition? Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Stephen Wills to help us understand what measures have been taken to govern these waters and what we might see moving forward. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back on Zoom. I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston, and whether in the room or on Zoom, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to Great Decisions, our first Great Decisions, actually, of 2024. Right away, a couple of thank yous. Thank you, as always, to the Lowell Institute, which generously supports our Great Decision series, our chat and chatter series, and our State of the State Department program. Thanks as well to our production partners at GBH Forum Network. Finally, thank you as always to Natalie Mace and the other great World Boston staff who are here tonight behind the Zoom. Before we get started, a few reminders. As you may know, the mission of World Boston is to foster international engagement and global cooperation. So thank you for taking part in this mission. And now, at long last, let's go to tonight's program. Dr. Stephen Wills currently serves as a Navalist for the Center of Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. He's an expert in U.S. Navy strategy and policy and U.S. Navy surface warfare programs and platforms. His research includes the history of, of the U.S. Navy strategy development over the Cold War and immediate post-Cold War era and the history of the post-World War II U.S. Navy surface fleet. He's had a 20-year career as active duty U.S. Navy and served on a variety of small and medium surface combatants, including an assignment as executive officer of a mine countermeasures ship. He's also held shore-based billets at the Defense Intelligence Agency, NATO, Joint Forces Command, uh, and many others. After retiring from the Navy in 2010, he completed a master's and PhD uh, on military history at Ohio University. He's the author of Strategy Shelved, The Collapse of Cold War Naval Strategic Planning, published by the Naval Institute Press in July 2021, and with former Navy Secretary John Lehman, Where Are the Carriers? U.S. National Strategy and the Choices Ahead, published by Foreign Policy Research Institute in August 2021. Uh, his articles have appeared widely. I'm not going to through all of this because uh, you can read more on our website, and we want to hear Dr. Wills. Uh, he also holds a master's in national security studies uh, from the U.S. Naval War College and a bachelor's in history from Miami University in Oxford. So um, at last, Steve, I want to say thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'll turn things over to you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to all uh, who are who are joining tonight, and I look forward to uh, talking with you here about uh, the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty, uh, some of the history behind it, and how it's op how the opposition to that 
uh, treaty has evolved over time and what implications it has for today. Uh, and there are a number of them, and they cross a number of different boundaries that not everyone uh, is aware of. So with that, what I want to do is go to a set of slides that I have, and uh, we'll, we'll kick it off here. So again, as I say, we're going to talk about uh, the UN Law of the Sea Treaty process, because that goes directly to the authority base uh, for the High Seas Treaty uh, that Mary spoke of. And we'll talk about implications, especially for today. And this stretches all the way to what's going on in the Red Sea right now, uh, what's going on in the Black Sea in terms of the Russo-Ukraine War, but also within the wider Indo-Pacific Indo as well. And you can see here just how much the exclusive economic zones of nations extend out. Now, it may not look very wide here on this global map, but as we get into it, you'll see that it's, it's a significant amount of territory that individual nations exercise control over, thanks to the UN uh, law of the sea process, and where they sometimes come into conflict with each other. Okay, so a little bit of the historical background here. So where do we get uh, a United Nations law of the sea process? This was negotiated largely across the, the 1970s, and a number of things uh, played a role here. One of those are arguments over fishing. Now, there have been arguments over fishing, you know, forever and a day. Some of these became very, very challenging. In the early 1970s to the mid-1970s, you actually saw two NATO members, the United Kingdom and Iceland, actively fighting over fishing zones. Uh, within you know their, what they claimed to be the boundaries of where they could fish. And this got to the point where you had warships from the Royal Navy and Coast Guard vessels from Iceland ramming each other. Um, you also had the development of deep sea mining and the development of the ocean bed in general and uh, nations being able to claim uh, mineral rights within certain zones. Uh, so across the 1970s, uh, the negotiation process begins, and what becomes the UN Law of the Sea is largely in place by 1982. However, a number of nations rejected to that, especially in terms of deep seabed resource provisions. And one of those was the United States. The United States was concerned at that time that uh, its deep sea mining uh, abilities would be impacted, and, and the United States would not be able to access key undersea minerals that it had already discovered uh, for fear that they would be within someone else's zone. So the United Nations went to a great deal of trouble to try and create uh, accommodations for the United States and others that did oppose this and reached agreement in 1994 that amended many of the deep sea uh, seabed provisions that the number of industrial nations found uh, objectionable. Uh, and we'll get into the ratification process here in a minute, but more on what is UNCLOS, the regime of UNCLOS itself. It covers a variety of sea issues. Uh, it's set boundaries for what constitutes an exclusive economic zone. So 200 nautical miles out from your boundary uh, as a nation, you get to exercise a great deal of rights in terms of fishing, seabed mining, environmental conservation, and control over the marine environment. We'll talk about that. There's also a tribunal element to UNCLOS uh, to adjudicate disputes. You know, nations, people have disputes, nations have disputes. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. To date, while many have been concerned that these would be deep national disputes about, hey, my boundary is here, you can't come in here, they've almost entirely been fishing related. Not surprising, again, disputes over fishing there are records extending back into the Middle Ages on this. Uh, so that's not surprising. In recent years, you've also seen disputes regarding climate change and especially rising sea levels. The nations of Micronesia have taken uh, cases to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea uh, regarding what they feel is a danger of rising sea levels to their you know, atoll-based nations. And that's a threat. So from here, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please, where we'll talk a little bit more about UNCLOS history, who's ratified, and what it looks like. So real quick, I talked about those zones that UNCLOS helped to set uh, in place. And you can see that in the graphic on your lower right, uh, extending out from land and out to the high seas. So you see archipelagic waters there, 
uh, within island zones. There are lines drawn to mark these. Those remain national waters. Your territorial sea base line. Uh, again, that's an internationally drawn line to show where your 200 nautical miles begin. We still stretch out to about 12 nautical miles of purely territorial waters. Uh, contiguous zone goes out to 24. And then your exclusive economic zone goes all the way out to 200. Once upon a time, it was only a three nautical mile limit uh, because if you've visited USS Constitution there in Boston itself, the top range of those guns on warships and in forts from the age of sail was about three miles. So you could control what you could manage with cannon fire from shore. And uh, as we've gone along, um, you can see here that that range has gone out. But the current UN limit is 200 nautical miles for your own exclusive economic zone where you as a nation would have control. And then after that, it becomes the high seas. Uh, as I said earlier, the U.S.'s own disapproval of UNCLOSE was rooted in sort of these concerns over maintaining autonomy for industry, but also a concern, as with so many other U.S. oppositions to U.N. organizations, that somehow uh, U.S. citizens would be dragged before an international court where it was felt they wouldn't have proper representation. At the time of when UNCLOSE was ratified, the U.S. was a big uh, leader in seabed mining. And we'll get into this as a little more as we go along. Um, and even though the United States was not interested in ratifying UNCLOSE in the 80s, as that additional negotiation for seabed issues went on, uh, the Reagan administration set precedent by generally following all the UNCLOSE provisions. So while the United States hasn't signed it, uh, hasn't ratified it, it, it still follows just about everything UNCLOSE uh, demands in terms of, of national recognition. Uh, a little more history here. The Clinton administration was interested uh, in getting ratification, but couldn't get it in the 90s. Uh, moving into the 2000s, there was a very strong uh, bipartisan uh, support for the UNCLOSE treaty. Uh, the Bush admin, uh, the Democrats, but again, ratification was defeated by a small group of anti-UN senators. Again, as the seabed issue has moved into the past, um, it's become more of an anti-UN uh, opposition base to UNCLOSE. Uh, a little more history here. Again, the Obama administration supported it, again, opposed by the same small group. Um, but in this case, the situation has further changed for the support because most U.S. corporations are in support of UNCLOSE now and feel it would be a good idea to join UNCLOSE and it would support their business uh, operations. The United States Navy and the United States Coast Guard are firmly in favor of joining UNCLOSE and have been for many years with the common understanding that we cannot sit in judgment on others in terms of a treaty that even though we follow, that we're not an official part of. Uh, that becomes uh, a challenge. Uh, as you see here, how can you call out the People's Republic of China, for example, in the South China Sea, or what Russians are doing to limit grain trade in the Black Sea if we're not part of the UN-based uh, process? And yet again, we still, to this day, largely adhere to just about everything uh, in the UN Law of, of the Sea provisions, even though we have not formally ratified uh, the treaty. A lot of the opposition over time was based on the seabed mining and, as I said, anti-United Nations. But seabed mining has changed since the 1980s. Uh, you can see here, although the, the graphic is not super great, uh, immediately to the right are a series of deep seabed concessions that the United States obtained uh, a number of years ago, back in the 1960s and 70s uh, in the Pacific. Uh, it was desired at the time of UNCLOSE to very closely preserve these uh, as U.S. You know, claims. And the feeling was, well, if this uh, gets into UNCLOSE uh, territory, that somehow the U.S. would lose claimant over these particular uh, resources. As it turns out, we've leased a number of these uh, over time. And the business, pro so again, the business process has changed so that <clears throat> there's good business in leasing these rather than actively mining them uh, ourselves. So again, thing, you know, things change uh, as time moves, moves, on, moves along, excuse me. 
Um, another opposition point, this freedom in the high seas uh, issue, that's the one that still remains. Um, and in addition, there's concern about EEZ enforcement, enforcement against bad actors, and joint payments that would be made to uh, UN International Law of the Sea Commission uh, that would be somehow redistributed amongst poor nations that don't get the benefit from this. Uh, that hasn't fully panned out yet. We haven't seen that yet in detail, uh, but it remains a, a point of, of opposition. Uh, and then finally, again, as I said earlier, there was the question about um, U.S. sovereign rights, another uh, point of contention with opponents that don't want to see U.S. companies, U.S. citizens, uh, the United States itself fined in some way for something that it did uh, with the feeling that the United Nations doesn't fully represent, quote unquote, the United States. Uh, and you see a couple of graphics here that explain sort of the process of deep sea mining. I wasn't fully uh, acquainted with it as well. I had to do some research here. Uh, it can be an ugly process, certainly in terms of resource extraction and can cause pollution at different levels uh, of the ocean. And you can see some of that here. And we can talk more about pollution uh, within the Q&A process as well. And we'll keep going here to the next slide. Okay, so... Again, I, I won't make one opinion or another here per se, but if you call out some nations as bad actors on the high seas for, for one reason or another, um, as the United States does sometimes, it's very difficult to sit in judgment on other people if you're not part of the enforcement process. Um, and even though uh, Russia and China are part of they're ratified members of UNCLOS. They still sometimes do things that uh, that the United States doesn't like, certainly. Uh, Russia has interfered with fishing in some places uh, over time, and it has uh, certainly interfered with fle free flow of maritime commerce uh, within the wider Black Sea region as part of its war against Ukraine. Uh, Russia, though, has faced a lot of opposition for what it does. Uh, it was not elected to the international, it was not re-elected to the International Maritime Organization Council at the end of last year. And since then, uh, the Russians have rumbled about leaving uh, not only the IMO, which is the UN's governing organization for maritime issues, but also UNCLOS itself, citing the fact that other members are not impartial. Um, of course, Russia has been called out for leaving. Um, other again, people have called out the United States for not joining in the first place. Uh, UNCLOSE plays a role in determining, as I said earlier, those exclusive economic zone boundaries, and that sometimes causes disputes. And you see here in the upper right, uh, ongoing disputes within this larger South China Sea area over you know, where your international uh, exclusive economic zone extends to. And China has entered into disputes with a number of nations over its economic zones, notably the Philippines. Uh, the UN arbitrated that back in 2014. China did not agree, excuse me, in 2016. Uh, be, arbitration began in 2014. Uh, China disagreed with the UN arbitration in its Philippine dispute in 2016. These maritime issues continue in other places today as well. Uh, for example, China and Russia abstained from uh, January 2024 UN Security Council ruling that demanded that the Houthis in uh, Yemen stop their commerce attacks within the Red Sea. Now, this all goes to wider maritime enforcement. If you're part of an international maritime treaty organization, you can have a firmer voice in making these calls. But when you're not, it's very easy, uh, to, again, to be called out uh, by organizations that you might disagree with, you might have absolute uh, proof in your own mind that they're doing something bad. Uh, but again, you can't call out Mr. Putin down there in the lower right in his Russian Navy costume uh, unless you're actually part of the enforcement process. Uh, so that's a continuing challenge. How does this impact you know, other issues that are out there right now? Uh, and certainly maritime conservation and a nation's ability to control that maritime conservation within that 200 nautical mile 
exclusive economic zone uh, plays into what's going now. Once upon a time, it was the Russians that had the very large fishing fleets that scoured the world's oceans and occasionally invoked the ire of various nations because the fishing fleet would turn up uh, within exclusive economic zones and outfish them, essentially overfish them. Um, today, it's the Chinese fishing fleet that is globally very active and sometimes gets into uh, people's national waters. Uh, the graphic that you see here is the movements of the Chinese uh, overseas fishing fleet in 2020 uh, that provoked a lot of unhappiness from South American nations uh, when they suggested that they had been overfished, again, within their exclusive economic zone. Uh, again, how can you call out this sort of overfishing if you haven't officially ratified uh, the United Nations protocols uh, that would make you part of the enforcement process uh, as a member of UNCLOS? So, so that's a problem again, with not being a member. Uh, when you come to the current uh, war in the Black Sea, and if you go to the, if you look at the graphic there at the uh, the bottom uh, right, that's a Russian warship under attack by Ukrainian drones. Um, there's not an enforcement process there. The United Nations doesn't have authority there. Uh, the United States might be able to you know, further call out what the Russians are doing, especially in terms of limiting uh, the movement of grain out of the Black Sea. But again, if you're not part of the enforcement process, you can't do a whole lot. Uh, when it comes to the Red Sea, and I think uh, my picture is blocking that right now. Maybe I can move myself out of the way here. Uh, that sinking uh, vessel that you see in the upper right uh, was hit by uh, a missile uh, and is now still in sinking condition, being towed to uh, port. But it has uh, many thousands of tons of fertilizer in it. Uh, so when you talk about these issues in terms of, you know, the environment and movement of trade and whose economic zone is where, uh, it becomes of importance. Uh, and if you're not part of the enforcement process, then you're not, you're more part of the problem than otherwise. Uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing is a global problem. Uh, the International Maritime Organization has been working this for a number of years, and it goes directly to uh, law of the sea provisions. Again, if you're a nation, you should be able to fish and control the extraction of fish, which are a resource, within that 200 nautical mile zone. Not everyone has the ability to control those uh, and even see out that far accurately to understand how much fish that you could potentially be losing. In conversation before we started, I was asked, well, how does this fit with, you know, Navy strategy and policy? Well, the ability to, you know, first of all, it goes to relations with, you know, friendly nations, allies and partners, uh, almost all of which have joined this, the United States, again, being an outlier. But it also goes to this IUU fishing problem. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of the Navy, Carlos del Toro, has identified this as a problem, especially uh, in this area that you see here within the wider Central and South American region, and has directed the latest uh, iteration of uncrewed U.S. Navy platforms, essentially unmanned vessels, to be focused on monitoring this issue. Um, and again, assisting these nations in the region who can't see out 200 nautical miles, perhaps, to see that someone's factory fleet is there uh perhaps you know illegally harvesting fish that should be under the control of that nation and with that uh i'll go ahead and finish up my main presentation i look forward to uh to questions about uh un law of the sea in general exclusive economic zones and any other questions you have about you know naval issues that that are taking place all over the world right now whether that's in the Black Sea, uh, the Red Sea, or the Indo-Pacific, and thank you. Wow, the sun never sets on this Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Steve. Um, Thanks, I'm actually gonna um, uh, take the privilege of being here on this Zoom um, by jumping in here. So this treaty mm -hmm. uh, is is very, very broad in, um, the the topics that it touches 
Um, so I'm wondering from your point of view, I mean, it sounds like you endorse um, ratification of yes. the thing. Um, let's say we can look at it in terms of economic impact, mm -hmm. climate or biodiversity impact, mm -hmm. um, or uh, security. Um, there's probably some other dimensions as well. But oh, yeah. why, why is, in your view, um, why is it important to the national interest of the U.S. to um, to 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 ratify this treaty and to get it ratified globally. I th I think it, it goes to so many of the international processes that that are so important to all of us. Certainly, there's global economics at work here. Um, the seabed mining issue has changed, in my opinion, since the 1980s. It's not the source of contention it once was. Uh, as I said, the, the U.S. has been willing to lease out some of its uh, its its own holdings that it acquired decades before, uh, because it's easier to do that than to have to mine them directly. So that that's changed uh, the global uh, focus on environment, especially in terms of fish. Uh, if you look at uh, the impact of climate change that we've seen and the movements of fish stocks. Uh, you know, fish can move entirely out of an area and a nation entirely loses control of that. Uh, and then the other points, the other, the third point I would suggest is the fact that UNCLOS has become this, uh, this governing framework, whether the United States likes it or not. And again, if we want to be part of the enforcement process and call out bad actors who are either overfishing, polluting, attacking free flow of trade and so forth. You really can't do this very effectively uh, when you're not a member of the wider UN process. And it hasn't proven to be the sort of infringement upon national sovereignty that I think many thought it was. Um, but sadly, it doesn't take that many people to oppose a treaty, even when you line up all the admirals uh, from the Navy and the Coast Guard, you line up business executives, you line up leaders from both political parties. It only takes a few people to be unhappy. Uh, so we just have to keep pushing away and hope that uh, we can wear down those final bits of opposition. Uh, I saw in one of your upcoming programs, you talk about the tyranny of the minority. Uh, that can be a problem in a lot of issues. So yes, that's what All I right. would do. All right. Thank you very much. So now we're going to go to... Um to the Zoomers in the room. Uh, we'll uh, go to Doug Reeves, please. Uh, Dr. Wills, thank you so much for a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, I wanted to specifically ask about the enforcement provisions because I'm I'm confused because if, if I understood you correctly, if we're not part of the treaty, we're not involved in enforcement opportunities, but you can see the US unilaterally taking action and the UK unil unilaterally taking action against the Houthis. So, What's the difference between enforcement within the treaty and enforcement outside the treaty? It's come to pass. And I think if you if you look back, especially back to the period of uh, Afghanistan and the Iraq war from 2001 forward, there's been a real desire to take on U.N. auspices for what you're doing uh, and getting the buy in of the global community and whatever you're doing is is important. And if you're not part of the overall process, even if you adhere to every part of it, um, there's always going to be somebody who can hold that over you in some way and call you out on that and say, well, you know, you're you're harassing me about this, but but you're not even a ratified member of, of this process. So why should I why should I listen to you? Uh, you're just the bully on the block. Um and, I, and as I said earlier, I think there's been enough of a change since the initial opposition back in the 80s and early 90s that the United States can, can get on board and join this and then be able to invoke, uh, you know, UN auspices for what it's doing in some of these places. Not that it's absolutely necessary. Obviously, the U.S. can do these things. Any sovereign nation can. But again, you know, invoking the wider you know, global good within what you're doing uh, from a practical standpoint is certainly important. We just saw where the UN Security Council was willing to call out uh, the attack upon, you know, free flow of commerce uh, in the Red Sea. And it's nice to be able to latch on to that uh, when you take on, uh, you know, you know, in this case, military action in the region. 
Uh, so that would be my push is that just being able to invoke that in addition to the other things you're doing helps, uh, you know, galvanize and, and support the U.S. position. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for your your great presentation. I was wondering if you 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 mentioned um, uncrewed systems. I was wondering if you could um, uh, just give a, a broader picture of the extension of um, it, of uh, naval resources and and reach using um, unmanned undersea and um, and surface mm -hmm. systems and how that can um, how that is you know further implementing our our policy and accelerating our kind of naval naval policy. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So we've come a long way. We've all, there've been radio controlled ships around for about 100 and I think 120 years now. It's been around for a while. Um but really we can do some remarkable things with those. They really become uh you know force multipliers for the service, especially in terms of being able to uh, monitor what is going on in a very wide region. Uh, radar only stretches so far, whether from land, uh, from another ship, or from even aircraft. So there are always going to be radar gaps out there uh, that are that are not fully covered. And having an uncrewed vessel out there can can fill in the gaps and give you a much better picture uh, to start with about what the surrounding sea zone looks like. And we can do a lot with an uncrewed system as well. We can measure uh, temperature. We can check on other aspects of weather in the region. Uh, all kinds of, of sensors alone uh, are there. And I think where the Navy is eventually going in terms of uncrewed systems is that every system that has a crew of people on board will travel about with its own constellation of uncrewed things that go with it. Uh, and those uncrewed things, again, uh, perform surveillance operations. One of them might be a, a mini tanker that you can take on some more fuel. Uh, another one might be another uh, weapon magazine uh, that you could have some more weapons with. If you remember that you know 1980s game, Missile Command, if one of your uh, missile batteries was destroyed, you could tap into others. Um, so there's a lot that a crewed ship with people on can benefit from if they have a little constellation of uncrewed things uh, around them. Um, and where it becomes practical in terms of law of the sea issues right now, again, is what we're seeing start up and transpire uh, in the Southern Hemisphere around South and Central America. The U.S. Navy pioneered a lot of these uncrewed systems uh, processes, especially for surface ones in the Persian Gulf region. Uh, and it developed a very discreet and very accurate picture of all the ships, uh, what was going on in there, uh, fishing, you know, all, all kinds of issues, even trash, you know, because trash will coagulate at sea into these like little plastic islands and uh, sadly, and um, uncrewed systems can help identify that. And again, the idea is that if you deploy these things, uh, especially in support of nations that don't have full access to all the radar and everything else, that those nations can see what's going on in their 200 nautical mile zone. So they have a better idea of who's out there, who might be pilfering their resources without telling them. So I would say the sky's the limit on this. I know a lot of people want to look at uncrewed systems and think, oh, it's it's the Terminator or something. Um, I don't look at it that way. You'll hear a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and these things doing amazing things. But at this point, we're glad that they complete a voyage from San Diego to Pearl Harbor uh, without you know, getting lost, without uh, being damaged along the way. So we're still in a learning curve process. And the way I think the Navy views these is very supportive of what the crude platforms are doing. Not so much we're turning the Terminator loose on the seas. Hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Willis. Thank you Good very evening. much. Interesting question. Uh congress uh, your interesting talk but one thing i you didn't seem to mention at the tail end of that and i kept waiting for you uh to mention it with bated breath was what the ukrainians seem to have done which is basically use it to sink russian ships yes the russian navy which is almost non-existent and outsize influence against what was always seemed to be uh, seemed to be as a huge uh much larger navy and a much more powerful yeah. navy uh but my question getting back to that is has um any of the 
for example, China took over these little atolls and built them. I think they're mm -hmm. called the Spratleys, among other things. Yes. Tend to be the most famous one. Has that come up? Uh, in front of UNCLOS, as well as the issues that China and the Philippines are having as far as, you know, going at it and, uh, you know, keep trying to keep uh, trying to keep the Philippines from uh, refueling some of their own atolls. Hey, those those are great questions, by the way. Let me hit the, the first one first. So so, yes, the Ukrainians have been very successful in using, you know, uncrewed sort of kamikaze jet skis uh, to. Uh, attack Russian Navy warships, uh, especially as you get close to the shoreline or what we call the littoral zone uh, in the Black Sea. And there's a real campaign of learning that's been undertaken by the Ukrainians. They get better and better drones. They seem to have better video. Uh, when you first saw this a year ago, the video was sketchy. Uh, the drones didn't always work. Uh, they were slow. They only used like one or two. And now you're seeing very coordinated attacks. Uh, with these, uh, where you get upwards of a dozen drones. There was a Russian uh, missile patrol boat named the Ivanovets, a fully capable Russian warship with missiles, guns, everything else uh, that was patrolling in an, basically a, an estuary in Crimea. Uh, so sort of an inland waterway, sort of a former lake that had been opened up to the ocean. And uh, apparently it was totally surprised uh, the Ukrainians attacked it with almost a dozen of these boats, and they used very complex tactics and very successfully. Three or four of the boats attacked and decoyed the Russian ship into turning away, and the Russian ship turned into four or five more boats, and they hit it six times, and it sank. And if you look up the video, you can see the whole battle take place in, in front of you. Uh, so that's quite remarkable. And I used to teach at the Naval War College, and one of the things they said is the closer you get to shore, the more complex, dangerous, and joint warfare becomes. So you can be threatened by all kinds of things closer in. And our Russian friends don't seem to have understood that campaign. Uh, they still send ships out by themselves, and that's a problem uh, for them. Um, so they, they don't seem to be learning well there. In terms of the Spratly Islands, yes. Now that's another place where you start to see those exclusive economic zones uh, clash. And that's been an area that's widely deserted. No one went there. Uh, there was nothing to be gained there. Uh, <clears throat> a few fishermen, you know, passed by there. You know, long ago, uh, back in the 19th and early 20th century, those islands were popular as, because, you know, it's nesting birds. So you go and pick up guano, uh, you know, bird droppings that was a, co a key component of gunpowder uh, at one point. Uh, but in the 20th and early 21st century, no one went there. Uh, so it was very easy, you know, in absence of presence, as some naval officer said once, what was it? Uh, virtual presence is actual absence. If you're not there, you can't control and you can't enforce the rules. Uh, so maybe if we had more uncrewed systems out there in support of these exclusive economic zones, then we'd see, oh, look, they're building, you know, they're turning the atoll here into a, you know, fighter base. Uh, we might want to keep an eye on that. So it was an empty, ignored space. And empty spaces often provoke exploitation. That's what we saw there. Um, and again, it was hard to call out China for these what they thought they were building and what they perceive as their, you know, exclusive economic zone. If we aren't part of the treaty again, it's hard to call them out. And I think the Obama administration mentioned that a few times uh, back in the 2010s, finding it difficult to get in there and call out the Chinese for that. Um, so I agree with you uh, where there's absence of, of surveillance uh, and absence of participation in these frameworks, then it's hard to enforce them. I have a question about the practical matters of um, enforcement and whether it's important or not. Uh, given that uh, a lot of legitimacy with people who care about that would be conferred on the U.S. if it were uh, to adhere to the, if it were a participant in the treaty rather than simply observing it without having uh, ratified it, uh, the U.S. sees uh, no problem uh, enforcing its notion of freedom of the seas, and it sees no problem acting against pirates off the littoral of Africa. True. or against the Houthis in the Red Sea. So practically speaking, what practical benefit, other than legitimacy, which of course is important, but what practical benefit uh, would obtain to the U.S. by actually ratification of the treaties? 
Well, it might be helpful in calling up more support from allies and partners, in my opinion. So a lot of times, uh, as you said, the U.S. has no problem, you know, enforcing whether that's, you know, an anti-piracy campaign, uh, you know, in the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mendeb Strait. That was my last job as a uniformed officer. I was at NATO and we helped put that one together. Um and you can't do these things well, in my experience, without having allies and partners along, just because there's there's just a finite number of resources. We only have 300 ships in the entire United States Navy, give or take, plus or minus, and we keep 100 of those deployed overseas at any given time. And the other two thirds are either involved in training or in maintenance and repair. And it's hard to maintain that sort of shuttle run movement of ships and people and we wear ships out we wear people out and if we want to do some of these kind of operations being able to invoke the un participation and then say hey you know we're part of the team too please come out and help us out with this the security council voted for it uh we've got some greater legitimacy here so i agree with you none of it stops the united states from doing some of those important roles you know in a lot of cases no one else will go and and provide uh, that sort of, you know, dare I say it, global policeman role. I know a lot of people don't like that uh, that term. But at the same time, the, the goods and services that we rely on uh, move in large numbers by ships. And uh, when those ships have to take a 2,500 nautical mile detour around uh, the Cape of Good Hope and, you know, burn more fuel, uh, pollute more air, uh, take more time, that affects all of us. So again, I think it's the ally and partner thing where if we can call on help, then we have some legitimacy. And if we get more people out there helping us, we can stay longer and it doesn't beat up our own people and ships quite so much. And hopefully that's uh, an answer that that works for that, sir. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, I uh, taught Law of the Sea at the Fletcher School for uh, many years, and you were both comprehensive and diplomatic in your uh, discussions of uh, <laughs> The One history prize. of ratification. So well done. And I was uh, it, it would be curious to hear uh, your thoughts on the latest effort to uh, adopt a, a oceanic treaty system, the, the High Seas Treaty. You know, the U.S. signed some fishing treaties in the interim, but the uh, uh, High Seas Treaty has um, uh, been open for uh, adhesion by uh, nation states. I just finished a War College article that denounced it as embodying the new economic order. Uh, what do you think its fate is? Does it matter? Is it just going to compound our history here? Yep. Well, sir, you're number one, you're going to be more of an expert on this than I am, probably. Um, but what I will say again is being part of the overall effort matters in places that we don't even necessarily know. So again, if you can invoke that international level of support, it could be for a crisis that we haven't seen yet. Uh, nobody necessarily expected that as uh, you know the the issues in Israel and and Gaza uh, started that a group in Yemen would start launching cruise missiles and ballistic missiles at merchant ships, for example. Um, and there are a lot of complicated political issues here. And you're right. I'm, I'm, you know, I always try to be diplomatic here. Um, but being able to call upon that international flag, I think is important. Um, what's my take on on this? I think again, we we face a tyranny of the minority where there's just enough people out there uh to prevent uh movement of these important treaties, even to a vote. Uh we just have a lot of dare I say it, hyper-partisanship out there that makes some of this stuff difficult. And unless you have that sort of collegial uh, activity within the legislature to help move and discuss and adjudicate people's concerns, legitimate concerns. Again, you know, in the 1980s, there were legitimate concerns about seabed mining, and there was an effort to you know, address those uh, within the United Nations uh, process. And you know, some of those issues, again, as I, at least my interpretation is they've changed since then, but yet we still have a few folks who don't want to be part of that. Uh, I would just respond to them, look, you know, you, you can always withdraw later if it's if it's a serious enough issue, uh, but there's a lot of good. I think you gain more with the good part 
and being part of the team than being an outsider. And I'd welcome any response you have to that, because again, you may, you've studied this probably more closely than I have, especially in terms of the current treaty. Uh, and I'll, I'll just be very quick that I, I agree completely. And I think the lesson here is the deep sea bed mining. That was the great yes. issue with the great concern. And if you talk to uh, U.S. business interests in this area, they would say much better to be at the table, to have clear regulations. If we have issues with them, to talk about them. I think it's the same set of issues on the high seas treaty. So I'll, I'll just leave sir. it at that. Thank you, sir. Most appreciated. Thank you very much for your speech, doctor. Um, I have a question about fishing. Yeah. And um, how, you know, the difficulty of enforcing it, how some of these people take it. In, um, in, in, I'm going to use an example of diamonds. Diamonds can be, they now have ways of tracing where diamonds come from, that they don't come from conflict areas. They call them blood diamonds. Yes. Is there anything, I'm just curious, have you heard anything or anything like that going towards fishing where there's, um, is there any way we can sort of see that these fish came from a sustainable, that they're not being, you know, and you're right, some of these fishing fleets are rapacious and it's not just the Chinese. There's, the Koreans are pretty bad. The Spanish are pretty bad. Um, so, and um, so it, it's, I was just wondering if there's any movement or any way of doing that, that we could say, okay, these fish came from a, you know, reasonably regulated uh, environment. Thank you. A lot of it comes from the, the tracking process from what nations or what groups the fish stock uh, comes from as it starts to proceed to market. Uh, but in some cases, it's hard to check because if it's consumed entirely by a domestic market after the fishing fleet returns, then it's harder to to track that. Um, and again, that's part of the, the impetus behind trying to get more of these uncrewed uh, ships out there. And some of them are very, very simple. Uh, there's one out there that you may have heard of called Sail Drone that's basically a surfboard with uh, a solar sail attached to it. And there have been other companies that have improved upon that basic design. But even with that, uh, you can measure temperature, salinity, you get a camera, uh, you get all kinds of, of interesting tools. And if you have enough of those out there, you start to develop that picture. So if you can develop a picture and have uh, an operation center on shore that tracks that, just a room with a few computers and uh, and people that get the, the feed from all of those various uh, uncrewed vehicles. And it might help us to develop a better picture of who's fishing where uh, and what they're taking. And it, fishing remains this very complicated subject because while fish traditionally stayed in certain areas and could be, you know, mapped, um, you know, as to their habitat and migration routes and so forth. With with some climate change issues, you get fish that like pick up and move uh, and do things that way. And then you get reseeding of, uh, as in like introduction of species into different areas. A few years ago, uh, the Russians introduced the spider crab into uh, Arctic areas away from where it's normally seen uh, off Alaska and that border between Russia and the United States. So you get these weird movements of fish too. So I agree with you, it's a challenge. I'm not aware of any other specific programs, but I'm more connected with defense. Uh, Coast Guard may have some, and I think that's a good question. And I think I'm gonna take that question that you've asked and ask it at our next meeting uh, where we discuss IUU fishing, because where the fish that are illegally or questionably caught go, is is just important is just as important as the fishing fleet you know itself and trying to track that so tracking the fish we spend more time tracking the fishing fleets than we do the fish itself so i think that's a great question and deserves more look so thank you um i hope this isn't too similar to a previous question that was asked but uh, you know it's been said recently reported on that isolationist sentiment has been increasing in the u.s um, and I was just curious, you know, you said that the U.S. has historically followed the principles of different mm -hmm. treaties, even though they haven't been a member of them. Mm -hmm. Do you see a future in which maybe they step away from what just willingly following it if isolationist sentiment increases? Well, the good news, at least right now, is the people that interact with the treaty provisions. So the uh, the business community that does mining uh, fishing interests within the United States, uh, the Navy and Coast Guard leadership in particular, there's there's full support for what UNCLOS does. 
uh, in general. And the good news is I don't see us stepping away from those unofficial following of the provisions. So that's at least a good thing. People get used to them over time. Um, and as long as there's not some sort of, you know, incident where some tribunal wants to haul, uh, say a U.S. Navy ship is, is transiting into port and spills fuel or something like that and creates a giant ecological disaster like Exxon Valdez from, you know, decades ago. Now that might cause somebody to say, you've ruined my exclusive economic zone and I'm going to hold you financially responsible. Um, that could provoke unhappiness. And that but that exists for any country. These are great laws and frameworks until there's some egregious, you know, violation. And nobody in our practical world, no one wants to pay for these things. Um, if you're good, you accept the fact that you've spilled oil uh, and you get in there and you pay for the cleanup costs. Um, I've seen a number of incidents over time, small scale incidents where U.S. Navy ship did something bad. And when that happens, we pay up. Uh, certainly the U.S. Coast Guard does too, because they're actively engaged in the enforcement process. So uh, I understand your concern. I think, the, hopefully, I think the good news is we're not in danger of stepping away from this particular international agreement, even though it hasn't been ratified by, again, a, a, a minority. Uh, I think the unofficial following of this will fully continue. And I still like to think we're moving closer to eventually ratifying it rather than moving away from it, despite some of the other, you know, issues that we have with, you know, isolationist tendencies. Thank you so much. I think, unfortunately, we've we've reached the the end of our time, but um, I hope everyone will join me in virtual applause to Thank Dr. Stephen Wills. Thanks, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you so very much for having me.